Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. From Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark Cards bring you a true story from the life of Dr. Sigmund Freud. Starring tonight, Mr. Lou Ayers. On the Hallmark Hall of Fame. And here is our distinguished host, Mr. Edward Arnold. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Tonight we bring you a true story transcribed from the life of one of the world's foremost men of medical science, Dr. Sigmund Freud, doctor of medicine, neurologist, psychopathologist, and psychoanalyst. It is given to few of us to understand the depth of his genius, yet his work has affected us profoundly. It has transformed our methods of education, the administration of our laws, the practice of our medicine almost every aspect of our lives. We are pleased and proud to have as our star tonight, portraying Dr. Freud, Mr. Lou Ayers. Now, here is Frank Goss. Here's a timely reminder. If any of your friends or relatives have just welcomed a new baby and you'd like to add to the proud parents' happiness, send a Hallmark card. At the fine stores that feature Hallmark cards, you'll find a charming collection of baby cards. Cards that reflect the excitement, the wonder, and the joy of this happy event. And on the back of the card you send, there'll be the hallmark and crown, the symbol you look for when you care enough to send the very best. And now with Lou Ayers, starring as Dr. Sigmund Freud, Mr. Arnold brings you the Hallmark Hall of Fame. When Sigmund Freud was born, an old woman who claimed to read the future prophesied that he would achieve both happiness and great fame. Thirty-five years later, in 1891, Freud had found happiness in his marriage and his children. But in his profession, neither happiness nor any of the predicted fame. He was an obscure doctor, a neurologist, engaged in private practice in Vienna. With little reputation, few patients, endless financial worry, and worst of all, deep uncertainty and self-doubt. Well, Aunt Bertha, won't you try to understand? I've made this decision solely for your sake. My sake? When you send me away? I'm merely referring you to another doctor better qualified than I. I don't want another doctor. But I've been treating you now for weeks without any permanent results. I don't care if I feel better, so long as I can tell you when I'm frightened and about the strange sounds I hear. Oh, please, let me come here to talk to you. I'll pay you just the same. Ten golden, just to listen? No, Fräulein, you need medical treatment. I'll write a note introducing you to Dr. Wagner. I'm sure he can help you if you trust him, cooperate. No, no, I won't, I can't. He won't understand me. No one ever has except you. Please don't make me leave you. If I have to go to this strange doctor, I'll die. Oh, God. Come now, Fräulein, you know I can't force you to go. But if you insist that I continue to treat you... I do. I do insist. And I suppose I'll have to try a little longer. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Now, please, Fräulein, there's no need for all this emotion. Fräulein Bertha. Yes. Yes, Doctor. It's Sophie, Doctor. Oh, come in, Sophie. Oh, I didn't know you had a patient, Doctor. Frau Martha sent me down to remind you your supper will be early since it's your night to play cards. Oh, so it is. I'll tell Martha I'm nearly finished. Yes, Doctor. Well, young lady? Yes, Dr. Freud? I'm going to think about your case. We may discontinue with the present treatment, but if you have any doubts... Oh, no, Dr. Freud. You want me to get well, so I know you'll find the way. Oh, 
What little savages they are. But they'll soon be quiet, Sigmund. Sophie's putting them to bed. No, I don't mind their noise, Martha. Perhaps not. But when you have something weighing on your mind... How did you know? What a question. Is it one of your patients? Yes. A young girl. Bertha Lubeck. I've been treating her for a variety of symptoms. She hears imaginary sounds, has developed trouble with her speaking, and even a bona fide paralysis in her right arm. None of these has any organic basis, even though they're real enough and painful to Bertha. I guess she's a typical case of hysteria. Immediately after hypnosis, there's some improvement, but invariably her symptoms have recurred. And so today... Since it appears I don't know how to cure her, I urged her to see Dr. Wagner. Why do you assume Dr. Wagner knows? Why do you overestimate him and underestimate yourself? Martha, I can't take chances. I won't experiment on patients. Every doctor has to take chances, and every doctor has some failures. Dr. Wagner, even the great Joseph Brewer, they don't announce their failures. Even if they aren't sure they can cure a patient, they don't immediately drop the case. I suppose not. No, once Brewer did. Dropped a case? When was that? Eight or nine years ago. It was when you and I were engaged. I think I wrote you about it. Brewer had been treating a young woman for over a year, and then suddenly he stopped seeing her. I don't recall her real name. Brewer called her Anna O. Yes, I remember. You know, I hadn't thought of it before, but Bertha Lubeck's symptoms are similar to those of Anna O. The curious fact is that Brewer didn't treat her by hypnosis. He tried, but it didn't work. So he continued with a method which Anna O. herself more or less invented. She called it chimney sweeping. What on earth did she mean by that? It was very simple. Anna O. talked while Brewer made notes. Mostly she talked about her feelings and about the emotional events of her early life. When she was able to remember back to the first occurrence of a symptom, it disappeared. Disappeared for good? So Brewer said... They never tried the method with another patient. When I urged him to at least publish his notes on Anna O., he refused to discuss it. He seemed to feel the case was a blot on his professional career. Perhaps he didn't understand the case. Martha, you're a remarkable woman. I am? In what way? Well, to me, Joseph Brewer is a being who dwells on Olympus and breathes the pure air of science. I look up at him awed and dazzled, never dreaming that he might have such human feelings as guilt or doubt. But your eyes are never dazzled by anything of this world. What time is it? Not quite seven. Brewer's certain to be at home. But Dr. Ree and Dr. Rosenstein are coming to play to rock. Tell them I'm having a consultation. That sounds impressive. I'm going to bell the cat or is it beard the lion... Anyway, I'm going to force Brewer to drag out his notes on Anna O., which are moldering in his desk. Siggy, before you go. Yes? Remember that my unworldly eyes are completely dazzled by one thing in this world. Dr. Sigmund Freud. Sigmund, why do you persist in hounding me? In the case of Anna O. has medical importance, shouldn't that outweigh any personal feelings of doubt? I have only one feeling, that while the method of treatment was novel, it was also unsuccessful. Soon after I discontinued treatment, the patient was again quite sick. At least let me once again look over your notes. (sighs) Very well. But this has to be the last of it now. There, there you are. The day-by-day account. Oh, good. I want to refresh my memory on two or three points. First, her racking and persistent cough with no organic basis must have been a symptom of her emotional conflict. See, she recalled a series of incidents when the cough was particularly acute. The incidents were obviously related. I can't see that at all. Well, at the time, you yourself told me how her cough was invariably connected with incidents in which she feared being left alone. Yeah. Now here, now here it is. The original incident, December 16th. The patient described incident when she was 11 years old. Her father forced to forego a business trip because patient was ill. She remembered her father's great alarm because of her painful, racking cough. 
Immediately after recalling this incident, the patient no longer felt any desire to cough. January 10th. Patient's cough has not recurred. My observations may have been faulty. Sigmund, it's been well established that such cases of hysteria are caused by shock, some accident or illness which injures the nervous system. Well established? Yes. By whom? Well... Now do you recall the paralysis of her right arm? She traced it back to the night she sat beside her father's deathbed. Her arm was hooked over the back of a chair and it became numb. That was purely physical. Yet when she remembered it, the incident and her feelings, the paralysis disappeared. And it was the same with her frenzied reaction to the sound of bells, which originated with the bells she heard at her father's funeral. Isn't it evident, Dr. Brewer, from the case of Anna O., that this disease, which we call hysteria, is not caused by some physical shock or injury, but that it results from experiences in childhood which were accompanied by painful emotions, so painful that they are forced aside, deliberately forgotten? Anna O. loved her father and felt grief when he died. Why should she wish to repress such normal feelings? But normal feelings are often mixed feelings. Oh. What if she felt hate as well as love? Triumph as well as grief. What if she wanted all her father's love and failing to get it, in anger felt annoying resentment toward him? Oh, monstrous. Yes, it could be that in every one of us. Oh, I don't know, Sigmund. Oh, very well. I won't go so far. But as a scientist, can't you see the potential importance of this method? This chimney sweeping? Well, as I said, the... The method was novel, and I suppose it might have some value. Only if you publish these notes... Yes, but to use a method by which a doctor delves into a patient's most intimate thoughts. But the doctor doesn't delve. The essence of Anna O's discovery, this chimney sweeping, is that the patient, willingly and for herself alone, faces the devils of the past which plague her, those which are of her own creation. How well, sir, will you agree? <sighs> yes. Yes, I believe so. Good. As soon as I've worked up the additional cases, we can proceed. The book will be a triumph. A disaster. A complete disaster. Not one favorable review in any medical journal. The review from Munich is quite favorable. The one by von Berger. Ah. A theater critic. And a poet. He prates about surgery of the soul and tries to apply psychology to the distress of Lady Macbeth. I'd call that poetic insight. Call it what you like. We made a disastrous mistake. Because we didn't go far enough. We should take our facts, shape them into a theory, and state it boldly. And the sooner the better. Are you proposing that... That we either go forward or backward. Or sit tight until the storm blows over. No, Dr. Brewer. You and I have opened a door. Perhaps the door to the human mind. We've let in a gale that won't stop blowing overnight. Well, I don't propose to ride with the gale. I'm going to soar on it or be swept away. At least the air I breathe will be fresh. In just a moment, we'll bring you the second act of the Hallmark Hall of Fame. One of the things about St. Valentine's Day that we look forward to most is the excitement of the children. First, they have such a good time choosing valentines for their little friends and relatives, and then it's a delight to watch their faces as they open their own valentines on February 14th. If you want to bring a great big smile to the youngsters you know this Valentine's Day, go to a fine store that features Hallmark cards. There, among all the many, many valentines on display, you'll find a wonderful selection of valentines for the children. Valentines with that something extra you'd expect from Hallmark cards. For instance, one Hallmark valentine for boys has a shiny red auto that the child can take out of the card, assemble, and play with. Another Hallmark valentine is the thrilling reproduction of a pirate's treasure chest. Inside are ten valentine hearts, and inside each heart there's a place to insert a shiny new dime making this valentine both a card and a gift. There's even a Hallmark card for baby's first Valentine's Day. As well as Hallmark make your own valentines, the youngsters will enjoy assembling and sending. 
And there are little folks' boxes of 12 valentines, all ready to send for just 59 cents. And on the back of all these gay valentines is the familiar hallmark and crown, the symbol you look for when you care enough to send the very best. And now with Lou Ayers as our star, Edward Arnold brings you the second act of our true story from the life of Dr. Sigmund Freud. Sixty years ago, little, if anything, was known about the human mind. And so to attempt to discover what forces lay behind our thoughts was to set sail upon an uncharted sea. It was a voyage without landmarks, on which no ship had ever sailed before. In his later years, many other doctors joined with Freud. Some followed the course he charted, others, taking his knowledge, discovered new courses. But in the early years, when he first began his courageous journey, Sigmund Freud traveled alone. Well, Rosenstein, aren't you going to look at your cards? Ah, when you're the dealer, Sigmund, I don't have to look. <laughs> oh, you accuse me of tampering with the deck? I accuse you of being a master magician. A dabbler in witchcraft. Even here the hounds are baying. Well, let's have it. Uh, no, 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 Sigmund, forget it. On our way over, Dr. Ree and I were discussing the paper you gave last Tuesday on the uh, etiology of hysteria. Well? Oh, there's no doubt that it's, a, it's an impressive piece of work, Sigmund. A very comprehensive study. Extremely skillful. A brilliant piece of hocus-pocus. Isn't that what you mean? Mean about what? The address I made to the society. <laughs> I vote we table the discussion and pay our respects to the almond tort. Mm -hmm. You can talk while you're eating. Dr. Rosenstein, if you'll pick up the cards, I can set the tray on the table. Yes, of course. Now, while I'm pouring your coffee, tell me what you thought of Sigmund's paper. They began by hinting that I tamper with my facts. Uh, not your facts. It is only some of your conclusions. Specifically, what conclusions? Well, as I remember, you cited 18 cases of hysteria and said that in every case, the origin of the illness lay in disturbing experiences in early childhood. Yes, experiences of such a painful or shocking nature that they leave deep emotional scars. That's why I describe them as traumas or wounds. And you said that in all 18 cases, these so-called wounds or traumas were almost identical, and that you therefore contend that such experiences are the cause of all cases of hysteria. But uh, what if case number 19 should turn out to be different, or uh, case number 20? We can mm. only wait and see. My next two cases should prove to have different causes, then my theory is not universal. It's reduced to 90%. I'll be satisfied with that. I'm even more dubious on another point, Sigmund. Since these patients are all mentally distraught, couldn't these experiences they relate to you be uh, fantasies, stories they've invented? Oh, I'd say it's most unlikely. If they are fantasies, why are the patients so reluctant to describe them? Now, sometimes for days, even weeks, they tell me all kinds of inconsequential things designed to keep me, and primarily themselves, from knowing the painful truth. What you are willing to accept as the truth? Let's state it very simply. A patient has a secret which he knows you intend to learn. He engages in idle talk to divert your attention. But uh, you are not diverted. He sees that you will not be satisfied until you know his secret or think you know it. So what does he do? Cunningly, he creates a substitute secret, a fantasy which he relates so reluctantly that you accept it as the truth. You mean he creates a screen to hide the real secret? Really? Now I vote we table the discussion. But isn't it possible, Sigmund? Oh, the mind of man like the universe is infinite. In that infinity, everything is possible. It's not exactly a dream... Doctor, I'm awake, but when I close my eyes, I see a path. It's near a lake. It's autumn. And I always see a woman walking on the path, going away from me, walking very fast. You know who the woman is? 
In the summers, we went to stay at my grandmother's, Dr. Freud, my sister Louise and me. There was a lake in the house. Was it the same lake where you see the woman? Maybe, I don't know. No, no, it was summer when we went to grandmother's, so why are there leaves on the path? I hate winter. I hate rain. Do you think you know who the woman is? No, it might be my mother, but I can't see her face. No, it's not mother. She never went to grandmother's. Only Louise and me. Do you remember telling me about how you learned to swim? Yes, in the lake. We went rowing in a boat. Louise knew how to swim, but I was afraid, so mother pushed me and... I said mother wasn't there. I thought she wasn't there. <laughs> I told you it was Louise. <laughs> You're doing very well. Why, why do I mix? <laughs> I don't mean to lie. When I told you it seems real. Yes. Yes, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so the wind's too strong for you, Sigmund, huh? Oh, I'm sorry. I don't mean to crow over your dilemma. Tell me, when did you first suspect some of your patient's experiences were only fantasies? Well, I began to feel uneasy when Dr. Rosenstein suggested that they might be. Mm, a trifle late, considering you'd already made a sweeping public statement to the contrary. My statement seemed warranted in view of the facts. But now you've learned the bitter truth, that while facts can be useful... They're treacherous. Especially when it turns out the facts aren't true. Uh, true or false. Once you start arranging facts into systems, into theories, once you take the leap from isolated facts to a world-shaking pronouncement, you're simply inviting attack. Yet without theories, we'd still think the world was flat and that we're composed of earth, fire, and water. Oh, I agree. We need theory. But as a young doctor just beginning his career... Leave it to others. Leave it to someone else to find the right conclusion? Exactly. Dr. Brewer, I'm not ungrateful for your advice. But since I've already made my world-shaking pronouncement and since I now know I was wrong, it, it seems to me in all conscience I have to admit my error. Try to correct it. You... Why, you're not thinking of preparing another paper. If I don't, eventually someone else will discover my... Well, let eventually take care of itself. It might be years... And in the meantime, you have a career. A statement of that sort could ruin you. But as a doctor, isn't it my duty? Your duty, Sigmund, is to yourself. And above all, to your wife and children. Martha? Yes, Siggy? Why did you marry me? Because when you were born, a gypsy said you would be rich and famous. If I thought that... Sigmund, what's wrong? Do you remember the night Dr. Rosenstein attacked my paper on the 18 cases? I certainly do. I thought he was ridiculous. No. He was right. In one case after another, I found out my patients weren't telling the truth. The experiences they described, which I took to be the origin of their difficulties, were all fantasies created to hide the real causes. And the question is, what shall I do? What do you want to do? Ah, there's the rub. As a doctor, well, I've made a blunder. And yet, because I've discovered it, somehow it feels more like a victory than a defeat. But as a husband and a father... Yes, Siggy? Well, Dr. Brewer says if I admit my blunder, I'll be ruined, that I'll get even fewer patients. And when I think of you and the children... Sigmund, shall I really tell you why I married you? One of the many reasons. Because you have a quality I've never known in anyone else. The quality of genius. That's even more appalling than your answer about the gypsy. I mean the quality Gertie spoke about when he said the first and last thing required of genius is love of truth. Oh, but it's easy to love truth. The problem is how to pursue it. Even if I have the courage, I know so little. Only that in the depths of the human mind there are secrets hidden in darkness. Hidden secrets that didn't cause pain and illness. Sickness and even death. Yes, and perhaps no man can ever know them. 
Who can carry a lantern into that utter darkness? You can, Siggy. Truth is the lantern, and you must never forget. It is you who must carry it. Sigmund Freud acknowledged his error and paid dearly in continued struggle and probation, but he did not give up the search for truth. In order to understand others, he undertook to psychoanalyze himself. For 2,000 years, other men had tried in vain to follow the injunction, know thyself. Freud was the first to succeed. It took many years, but the reward was worth the struggle. Because of this one man, all mankind has come to know and understand itself much better. And now, here is Frank Goss. Mr. Arnold and Lou Ayers will be back in just a moment. Have you noticed that some people you know always do things with just a little more flair than others? Oh, maybe it's the way they entertain or do a table setting or a flower arrangement. But whatever it is they do, it reflects added thought and attention. And this happens, too, when you give presents wrapped in Hallmark gift wraps. Adding this distinctive, smartly styled paper is an extra touch of thoughtfulness that makes your gift doubly appreciated. At the fine stores that feature Hallmark cards, you'll find the colorful array of Hallmark gift wraps for just about every occasion you can think of, including birthdays, showers, weddings, and blessed events. Some of these designs are smartly simple. Others have an amusing air about them that will add to the excitement of a child's present. And right now, you'll find beautiful Hallmark gift wraps for Valentine presents. Some have bright, gay valentine hearts in distinctive new designs. One lovely gift wrap blends red roses, white doves, and golden musical notes to create a charming romantic valentine effect. Whatever the occasion, you'll find that a present wrapped in Hallmark gift wraps is wrapped in thoughtfulness and beauty. You'll recognize the Hallmark gift wraps by the familiar Hallmark and Crown, the symbol you look for when you care enough to send the very best. Now, here is Edward Arnold. Our thanks to you, Luez, for a fascinating portrayal of a remarkable man. It was a pleasure to be with you, Eddie. And you know it's an added pleasure for an actor to be on the Hallmark Hall of Fame because we always learn something new from your glimpses into the lives of real people, like Dr. Freud. Well, I certainly hope you'll come back soon, Lou, and I suggest you listen in next week because we're going to dramatize a most interesting and unusual detective story about the master French criminologist Alphonse Bertillon. And our star will be Mr. Charles Boyer. That uh, sounds wonderful. I'll certainly be listening. Good night, everyone. Good night, Lou. And until next week, this is Edward Arnold saying good night. <laughs> Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give expert and friendly service. Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. The Hallmark Hall of Fame is produced and directed by William Proof. Tonight's transcribed script by Sylvia Richards. Featured in tonight's cast was Virginia Gregg as Martha Freud. Others were Charlotte Lawrence, Vivi Janis, John Daner, Jack Crucian, Victor Rodman, and Whitfield Connor. Be sure and enjoy the Hallmark Hall of Fame on television every Sunday over another network. Consult your newspaper for time and station. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you until next week at the same time when you hear a true story from the life of Alphonse Bertillon starring Mr. Charles Boyer on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Over the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>